and welcome to the Halloween Spooktacular edition of New World Next Week. I'm your co-host, James Gorbett of the Corbett Report. <laughs> <laughs> Putting the gore in the Corbett, and I am indeed James Evan Pilato from the frightening media monarchy kingdom, and this is New World Next Week, episode 570, which is... Kind of scary right there, James. Whatever the motivation behind this incident, there's no justification for any attempt to disenfranchise voters. And we have got that story, plus bricks dropping a manifesto. But first, hey, it turns out plants crave even more than we thought. Oops, science was settled till it wasn't. Plants absorb 31% more CO2 than thought. Grabbing this from What's Up With That, a new study reveals that plants have been absorbing 31% more CO2 than previously believed. 31%, not 3 or 1, a glaring error that casts serious doubt on the climate models, emission scenarios, and policy prescriptions like the deadly net zero. For years, we were told that the science is settled, and this isn't even getting into their MAGA jabs and COVID vaccines, and that urgent action was needed to avoid catastrophic warming. But this discovery suggests that our models have been dramatically underestimating Mother Nature's ability to manage CO2. This revelation not only upends the rationale behind aggressive policies, but also raises broader questions about the supposed certainty of climate science. Even the phrase, settled science, has been the bedrock of climate advocacy for decades, really, of course, all kicked in the last four to eight years. We've been told that if we don't make rapid, costly, dangerous, deadly changes, we'll face imminent disaster. I'm pretty sure Time Magazine and Greta said we'd already be dead by now. Skeptics treated as heretics, while the so-called consensus was portrayed as unquestionable. James, quick sidebar. Have you noticed how quickly Greta fell from grace when she dared criticize occupied Palestine? Holy crap. I hope that's... That's probably a huge lesson for her going, ah, I'm learning things about the way the world works. Continuing, it turns out we were 31% wrong about something as fundamental as CO2 absorption. This isn't a minor correction. It's a massive revision that undermines the credibility of the models driving the policy. Climate models are the tools used to predict warming and guide the policy. They've been treated as specific scripture. I like that driving policies from emissions reductions to renewable energy mandates, but with a key assumption proven wrong. The model's projections are called into question. Climate models predicted rapid CO2 buildup, assuming limited natural absorption. Policies driven by these models were never proven to be beneficial in the first place, but were only assumed to be so. The discovery that plants are absorbing significantly more CO2 undermines the supposed need for extreme measures. And in other weather news, mysterious record methane surge since 2020 was not fossil fuels, but 90% due to microbes. 150 nations signed the Global Methane Pledge without bothering to check if all that methane was man-made. We shut down the modern world for the scamdemic. And hey, what happened? Methane levels rose even more. It seems that blaming fossil fuels for the global surge in emissions, but forgot to check the C-13 isotopes, James. We spend millions breathalyzing cows, the deadly cow farts, measuring their burps and farts, feeding them seaweed, but didn't think to do the basic chemistry. How could that be? Because as the joke now goes, they told me to follow the science, but all I found was the money. Gaps and in inconsistencies up to 41 billion in World Bank climate handouts. Oh, unaccounted for, new report finds. It's like all that COVID money or maybe Obama and Eric Holder's, you know, fast and furious guns. I don't know where they went. 41 billion of the funds distributed to climate causes by the World Bank between 2017 and 2023 are unaccounted for due to poor accounting standards. This according to an audit from Oxfam. The enormous sum represents almost 40% of the climate funds the bank dispersed during these last tribulational seven years, with World Bank data failing to show the, rece the recipients or the uses of the money. You'd think at least maybe one of them would make you feel a little okay. The bank's quick to, to brag about its climate financing billions, but these numbers are based on what it plans to spend and not what it actually spends once the project gets rolling. So says Kate Donald, 
head of Oxfam International's Washington, D.C. office with the great takeaway quote. This is like asking your doctor to assess your diet by looking at your grocery list and not looking at what ends up in your fridge. That's aspirational versus operational. James, settled science, methane pledges, and climate handouts. Well, James, this is one of those rare instances where I, as a color commentator here on New World Next Week, I really don't know what else to say to add to these stories other than to say, if you do not understand the significance of these three stories put together and the narrative that they're they're putting out there, then you're probably one of those people who emailed me years ago to say, I thought you were a credible person, but then you started talking junk about climate science. Oh, you're one of those woo-woo weirdos. I'm never listening to you again. <laughs> now... To be fair, I haven't had a lot of those emails in recent years, and I think that's because, finally, it has caught on, the public has caught on to the idea that after this pandemic, exactly as you say, yeah, I followed the science, but all I found was the money. Yeah, how could, how could science possibly be corrupt? How could there possibly be any corruption amongst these scientists and researchers who float on clouds and only care about the truth? <laughs> well, now people are finally starting to question the big pharma science, and I think that means that they can't pretend that they don't understand the concept of flawed climate science anymore. In the same way that, as I've always said, one of the, the key things that the 9-11 Truth Movement actually accomplished was, at the very least, to wake the public up to the concept of false flag terrorism. People don't ask, why would the government attack itself anymore? Because it's very obvious why they would do that and blame it on their political enemies in order to start wars in the Middle East or what have you. Why would climate scientists possibly lie about or or fail to connect the dots or fail to measure the isotope of methane that's actually being released? Does this have anything to do with agriculture? No? <laughs> Oops. Oops. Oh, well. But exactly as I, uh, as I mentioned on uh, the Unlimited Hangout podcast the other day, I I'm holding my breath for them to say, okay, guys, you don't have to eat the bugs anymore. Doomsday has been called off because it turns out we were completely wrong. Oh, actually, plants absorb 31% more CO2. Oh, actually, the methane is not coming from agriculture. It's coming from microbes. No, they're not going to call off doomsday because it is always doomsday because that is how they get their payday and all of the uh, controls that come along with that. So that is what this climate science is about. Anyway, I said I have nothing to add, but I guess I always have something to add. <laughs> I I would assume they'll just they'll they'll fail forward. If at worst they'll admit, oh, I'm sorry, your government failed you. Give us more power and control, and we swear the the rules and controls will will be more dialed in next time. That's how we get started on New World Next Week, episode 570. Our second story, BRICS just dropped a manifesto for the New World Order. Grabbing this from our friends at activistpost.com, James, and I noticed you were like two or three of their related recent stories on the sidebar. This week's Kazan Declaration suggests that the BRICS, in its expanded composition, is ready to open a new chapter in its history. Never before have such voluminous documents been adopted as a result of the group's summits. Now, James, t test me here. Bra is it Brazil, Russia, India, China, Spain? South Africa. South Africa. Oh, would have put my money on Spain. Okay, thank you. Moreover, the Kazan Declaration will be the subject of great interest in the world's political and academic circles, as well as the subject of criticism of opponents of BRICS. For the first time, the group's unified vision of the current state of the international system is set out in detail. The Declaration, a voluminous document containing 134 paragraphs, some of which are quite long, which might not sound that bad, but compared to, to what they've done before. The statement adopted at the previous summit in Johannesburg in August 2023 was only 93 paragraphs, and the document adopted in Beijing in July 2022 was 75. So, of course, it keeps building. And they don't think it's mission creep. Thus, year by year, the outcome has become increasingly detailed and is now customary to say substantive, reflecting the gradual increase in the intensity of the group's engagement and the broadening of the substantive scope of its multilateral co cooperation. The Kazan Declaration consists of a preamble in four sections dealing with strengthening multilateralism, global and regional security, financial and economic cooperation, and humanitarian exchanges. 
For the first time in BRICS history, the declaration sets out in detail the group's shared vision of the current state of the international system, the common or overlapping approaches to the fundamental global problems of our time and to acute regional crises and the contours of a desirable and achievable world order as the members of the group currently see it. The, the 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 details of the plan have been altered. Pray, pray they don't alter it any further. Would you like to know more, James? I, I, I would. Where can we possibly <laughs> find out more? Oh, I know. Okay, how about instead of going, because as astute listeners and readers out there will know that that our activist post article is one of these rah rah bricks are changing changing. They're bringing in the good new world order kind of articles. But the antidote to that, of course, comes from Ed, uh, Edward Slavsquat at the Edward Slavsquat Substack. Um, would you like to know uh, what the BRICS Declaration is all about? Well, yeah, it's it's an interesting phenomenon because when you read, and I've read several of these rah-rah BRICS are saving us from the evil globalist um, type articles about this Kazan Declaration, but interestingly, not a single one of them actually links to the Kazan Declaration. I wonder why they don't want you to actually read it for yourself. Hmm. Anyway, we will do that. We'll put that in the show notes so that people can go and actually read it for themselves. Don't take my word or anyone else's word for it. But when you do so, you will find out, as Edward Slavsquat points out, oh boy, all of these people writing about how this this declaration is a double death, death blow to the globalist guys. And yet they don't quite quote from it. Like, for example, quote... Again, this is a quote from the Kazan Declaration. We stress the universal and inclusive nature of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. Or, quote, we note the important role of multilateral development banks and development finance institutions, dot, 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 in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Or, quote, "We we reiterate that the objectives, principles, and provisions of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change its Kyoto Protocol, and its Paris Agreement, uh, blah, 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 must be honored. Uh, We will strengthen cooperation on a whole range of solutions and technologies that contribute to the reduction and removal of greenhouse gases. Uh, Quote, we recognize the important role of carbon markets as one of the drivers of climate action and encourage enhancing cooperation and sharing experiences in this field. Or, quote, we reiterate our support to the central coordinating role of the World Health Organization in the implementation of multilateral international efforts to protect public health from infectious diseases and epidemics and commit to reform and strengthen the international pandemic prevention preparedness and response system. Or, quote, recognizing the importance of creating an enabling, inclusive, and secure digital economy and the digital connectivity is an essential prerequisite for digital transformation as well as social and economic growth. We emphasize the need to strengthen cooperation among BRICS countries. We also recognize that emerging technologies such as 5G satellite systems, terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks have the potential to catalyze the development of the digital economy. All right, et cetera, et cetera. So as uh, Slavsquat goes on to point out, the theme of this year's BRICS summit was strengthening multilateralism for just global development and security. I think we all understand why BRICS, BRICS chose this theme, because it's very meaningful and profound. In sharp contrast, the G20, which includes the USA and many other unipolar satanic West nations, will be meeting next month in Rio de Janeiro to discuss building a just world and a sustainable planet. The contrast could not be more extreme, like day and night. So here's here's a little quiz that he ends you with. Which of these statements is from the BRICS Kazan Declaration? Statement A. We reaffirm our support for the rules-based, open, transparent, fair, predictable, inclusive, equitable, non-discriminatory, consensus-based, multilateral trading system with the World Trade Organization at its core with special and differential treatment for developing countries, including least developed countries, and reject the unilateral trade restrictive measures that are inconsistent with WTO rules. Or, statement B... We express our support for actions aimed at reaffirming that a rules-based, non-discriminatory, fair, open, inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and transparent multilateral trading system with WTO at its core is indispensable. We support policies that enable trade and investment to serve as an engine of growth and prosperity for all, fostering a favorable trade and environment for all. Investment environment for all. Which is which is from the Kazan Declaration, and which is a literal G20 communique? Because... Uh, spoiler, wh- they're, they're one or the other, and 
Could you tell from those statements which is which? Nope, because they're the same thing. It's the old office meme. Corporate wants you to tell the difference between these two pictures, G20 and Brix. Uh, no, they're the same. They're the same picture. Anyway, people who don't understand this yet, again, just aren't paying attention and are probably the types of people who still believe Putin's the savior and all of that nonsense garbage. Uh, I've talked about this at length before. I will link up my uh, Truth About the Bricks um, editorial that I wrote years and years ago that's as relevant as ever. And James, you're exactly right. Trying to remember Bricks, why, what, Brazil, Russia, why, why South Africa? Precisely and solely, I guess you could have two reasons for that. One, because it's in Africa and they needed an African country. So South Africa, why not? But two, because BRICS is completely and totally, a totally made up, dreamt up idea of economies that essentially have nothing to do with each other, governments that have nothing, no actual linkage between them, except, of course, the entire BRIC concept was dreamt up by Jim O'Neill. At uh, what what bank was that? Goldman Sachs. Yeah, uh, look into the history of BRICS, where they come from, and what they are actually saying in their declarations. And lo and behold, meet the uh, the new world order, same as the old world order. James, I'm glad we will link up the actual information that is being discussed. I've always I've always found that one of the one of the neat things about the internet, you know, hyper hyperlinks and such. So we've just been setting the table. Let's let's get lit now, you guys, with your Shocktober selection pre-show festivities underway in America. Police searching for person who set ballot boxes on fire in Washington and, of course, Portland, Oregon. With just days until Election Day, hundreds of ballots were destroyed by fires early this week at two drop boxes in the Pacific Northwest, and investigators are searching for a, recul for a culprit they say is responsible for both. Many of the ballots in a drop box in Portland were unaffected, but hundreds of ballots were destroyed in a second ballot box fire in nearby Vancouver, Washington. Vancouver, Washington's just across the river. It's basically a suburb of Portland, Oregon. There are folks who live in the more affordable Vancouver, Washington, and then go work in the more lucrative Portland, Oregon. The incidents are believed to be related to a third incident earlier this month in Vancouver. Police worked to put out a ballot box fire in Vancouver, Washington. The incidents come as our good friends at Homeland Security have a bulletin from September that I guess they didn't want to share with us, so we had to get it from some watchdog group called Property of the People, which warned, quote, some social media users are discussing and encouraging various methods of sabotaging ballot drop boxes and avoiding detection, likely heightening the potential for targeting of this election infrastructure through the 2024 election cycle. Election infrastructure remains an attractive target for some domestic violent extremists, some of which aren't the FBI and Unit 8200 online ginning all of this up, and other threat actors with election-related grievances who seek to disrupt the democratic process and election operations as we have been noted to do in countless nations around the world. Make no mistake, an attack on a ballot box is an attack on our democracy and completely unacceptable, the Oregon Secretary of State said Monday. Whatever the motivation behind this incident, there was no justification for any attempt to disenfranchise voters. An ins this is interesting. An incendiary device was attached to the side of a ballot drop box when Portland police responded at about 3.30 a.m. this past Monday morning. Security personnel extinguished the fire. At a bus station in Vancouver, Washington, 15 miles away, a second ballot box was set on fire that same early Monday morning. Responding officers discovered a suspicious device smoking and on fire next to the box. All ballot boxes in Multnomah County, which is what contains Portland, Oregon, that's where, that's where we lived for over a decade, and Clark County in Washington have fire suppressant installed, election officials said during a news conference on Monday. So it's got fire extinguishers rigged up inside it. Multnomah County Elections Director Tim Scott said fire suppressant inside the Portland box protected over 400 ballots inside, saying only three were damaged. However... Election officials were still counting all the ballots involved in the Vancouver fire, but believe hundreds of ballots were destroyed. And if you can see the video, I mean, if you've ever scraped out your fireplace, it does not, does not look real good for those ballots. Less than 1% of people in Multnomah County vote in person. James and I know we've talked about this for the decades here in the New World Next Week kingdom. My wife and I 
We would always do the vote by mail in Portland. It felt so much better because I can do my homework in advance and don't have to go to some booth. And then turns out maybe that's an even easier way to gin up and rig this process. In Clark County, 60% of the ballots received are from ballot drop boxes. So they'll put these boxes all around the city so you can go drop off your ballot days in advance and they've already been tabulating things in America's next top Zionist 2024. In other tricks without treats, as U.S. election looms, Biden aides struggle with Middle East wars. It is not where the Brandon administration wanted to be less than a week before the U.S. presidential election. Israeli attacks with American-made bombs continue to wipe out Palestinian families in Gaza. The war in Lebanon's expanding. Israel and Iran's exchanges of direct attacks could escalate. With many progressive voters and Arab and Muslim Americans in battleground states furious at President Biden for his unwavering support of Israel's offensives since the devastating Hamas assault last year, U.S. officials had been desperate for some way to prod the Middle East towards stability. Then came Israel's October 16th killing of Sinwar. Sin war. James, I couldn't help but note for the Halloween season. Yes, war is a sin. You're right. Three weeks before the election, Brandon dispatched Secretary of State and noted Epstein and Maxwell family associate Anthony J. Blinken to the Middle East for that purpose. And finally, Gold prices hit record high amid election jitters, comma, rate uncertainty. James, this affects us both. Gold prices hit a record high in Asian trade as safe haven demand was boosted by increased political uncertainty in the U.S. and Japan, as well as anticipation of more cues on interest rates. There had been a Fed rate cut here not too long ago. The yellow metal had a slow start as a less severe than feared attack by Israel on Iran pushed up some hopes of easing tensions in the Middle East. Yes, we thought Israel was going to be like real Holocaust-y like usual. They showed some restraint. Safe haven demand remained underpinned by anticipation of a tight 2024 presidential election with voting set for, remember, remember, the 5th of November. Japan also added to the political uncertainty after a coalition led by the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, lost its parliamentary majority in a recent selection. James, U.S. and Japan, we're, we're really coming together in these end times. Indeed. And in fact, you've just hit upon my strategy that I'm going to employ for the next couple of weeks when people inevitably ask me about the selection. And what do I, what do you think about it, James? I am inevitably going to respond by going, oh yeah, the LDP lost its ruling coalition. And what do you think is going to happen? Do you think Ishiba will step down? Who do you think might replace him? Do you think the coalition will be able to, the opposition will be able to put together a coalition? Who do you think would lead that? And when people's eyes glaze over and they realize I'm talking about Japanese politics and they'll be like, I don't know, who cares? And I'll go, exactly. But anyway, yeah, here we are. Um, But, okay, so realistically, though, and uh, if I was to dumb this down to a soundbite of some sort, I will dumb it down to a soundbite that will be incomprehensible to people who do not understand polysyllabic words. Uh, I I would say not that the uh, action is in the reaction, as I know we often point out here, and as you pointed out for many years, but the reaction reifies the action, which is to say we know... This selection sideshow circus is garbage, nonsense, distractionary. It will not change anything, for example, with regards to U.S. Zionist uh, alliance, etc., etc. There's many, many ways that we have talked about in the past. It's meaningless, and your vote doesn't count anyway. (laughs) The voting machines will tell you who won. But because millions and millions and millions of people truly believe in it and have invested their entire identity in this selection process and in their their candidate, uh, it makes that into something that will manifest in reality. And so whatever happens next week, it's going to spill out and there's going to be, well, I can't imagine a scenario where there won't be mass protests and whatever, people losing their minds over, oh my God, the person I don't like just got into power. However did this happen? So whatever, again, the sideshow means nothing, but the fact that people believe in the show and will get violent and crazy about it, unfortunately, probably does have some ramifications. And at the very least, I I, I suppose we'll have to cover that aspect of this. But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. U.S. selection. Mm, Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah.
J- James, the way you described it right there sounds like a horror movie ritual for a Shocktober. Hey, just think, in like a few short days, we'll all be fighting over who stole the election. That is New World Next Week, episode 570. NewWorldNextWeek.com has hoodies and toques because it's starting to get cold. It is getting chilly here. It snowed for a minute this morning. We have now still never not seen a first snow in October in New Mexico. And I do always want to remind people we play the exclusive first run audio of these New World Next Week episodes before the video has been published anywhere. I get the first taste of it as soon as Brock is able to bust it out of the editing box. I get to play that Thursday morning after my Morning Monarchy show, and tomorrow will be Halloween, so it'll be a perfect bit of scary news for folks. James, in closing, when we were there, and I guess I I might... (laughs) You may have already answered my question with your shirt. When we were visiting you back in 2019, and we were at some store or mall or wherever we were, you're like, man... Halloween is starting to... It's slowly possessing Japan. It's really... So, so has it, if you, you're past the point of no return, you were worried about having to do decorations and candy and all this crap for another holiday. Yes, yes. Yeah, so to bring people uh, up to speed, yes, when you were here, we were talking about this because I hate Halloween. I detest it. It's a stupid holiday. I can't wait for it to be finished and over with. And so it was... So nice to come to Japan 20 years ago, where they kind of vaguely knew there was something called Halloween, and maybe on October 31st you'd go into a store and there might be a little jack-o'-lantern display or something. But there was it was not a thing. Fast forward 20 years, it's a thing. Uh, I, there was Halloween decorations up in the stores in September. Like, what is happening? No, all these stupid English teachers came to Japan and introduced Halloween, and Ah. they've injected it into the culture. So, unfortunately, it's a thing here now. So, I don't know. You can't beat it. Join it. Anyway, no, I am wearing this shirt for three reasons, of course. One, because, of course, it's Halloween. Two, because it's a crude joke, and people will go, you're above that, James. Why are you wearing a shirt like that? It, 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 it weakens your message, blah, blah, blah. And three, because it's a secret reference to a band, which I thought you'd appreciate. Anyway, um, do, can you can you figure out which band I might be referring to? Anyway, yeah. It's always on. Anyway, yeah, uh, that that's the answer. <laughs> James, I think, I, you know, that's another way you and I are a great compare and contrast. Yet again, you're like professor and, uh, and the, I'm the class clown. I enjoy Halloween. I enjoy the transgressive fun, again, of having a Christian upbringing. And it's a bit of the, you get to let loose and, and do all kinds of wacky, scary things. Like have a month-long horror film festival, James, it is getting to the last few days of Shocktober Surprise in the Media Monarchy Kingdom. It is, I would imagine, the scariest theme week of the year, as it is Woketober, and I'm playing all political horror, all the purge, Civil War, Founders Day, Brain Dead, and I've joked to to members, it's going to be a seamless transition from movies made up about political horror into real-life horror. James, that is New World Next Week, episode 570, buddy. I appreciate you as always, man. I appreciate you, and also, since you bring it up, I appreciate Brock, video editor extraordinaire, who bangs out these edits uh, for us week in and week out. The silent partner here, who is always doing some incredibly heavy lifting with the edits here. But on that note, he and his wife are expecting their second child literally any day now. So, just on a Corbett Report deprogramming note, You might notice there may be some uh, disruption in the usual video posting schedule at Corbett Report. I can't say over the course of the next few weeks, you know, if videos will continue to come out on a regular basis. Probably not. There may be some gaps there. Please know it's because video, video editor extraordinaire Brock West will be attending to the new life that he is bringing into the world. So I think he deserves some time off. Now, there may be a couple of videos in that time that come out and you'll notice, wow, these are kind of slapdash affairs. They're not really well edited. That's because I might do an edit or two myself in Brock's absence, if need be. But just note, when you see that really shoddy, not well put together video edit, that's because I'm the one doing it. And hopefully that will help you appreciate what Brock does silently behind the scenes even more. So everyone send Brock your love. 
And uh, yeah, thank you, Brock, for doing what you do. Thank you, James, for doing what you do. And uh, well, one way or another, I hope we'll be back here again next week. Absolutely, my friend. Take care. Take care.